Hello and welcome to another episode of Alaska Commercial Real Estate Today. We look a little different this week. Yes. Believe it or not, Alaska experiences power outages and we are not recording at our regularly scheduled time. We are recording at the wrong time and thus it is casual Friday in the studio and in the uh, Alaska commercial real estate appraisal studio. What the yeah. heck do we call this studio? <laughs> I don't know, but we're not getting a lot of work done, so we're going to get this done. Well, it has been a roller coaster of a week. Interest rates have risen. Uh, who could have predicted that? Oh, I mean, it's almost as if they'd been saying they were going to do it for two years. Right. Um, what else is happening this week? Oh, uh, there's been some problems in the hotel sector. Yes. Um, well, for a long time coming. Yes. Well, I mean, as we know, that whole 2020 blip. Yeah. Uh, that the world oh. experienced. Uh, really did affect hotels dr drastically, we of did. course. Um, and some have not really recovered. Uh, they're facing their loans coming due, loan payments, yeah, or any deferred payments that they've had, um, causing some of them to go into bankruptcy. Yeah, so uh, ironically, when... Um we were maintaining and listening, maintaining. We were listening to uh, the trends that come out because uh, the same industry, the same entity provides an economic outlook for this industry. And they were one of the first um, entities to begin predicting that something was happening yes. prior. Right. It was December of 2019 when you first came to me and said, hey, the hotel industry is talking a lot about this illness that's yeah. coming out of Asia and it seems to be spreading. And they already in December yeah. of 2019 are looking at how they're going to be affected in the next one or two years. Yes. Well, um, boy, were they right. Yeah, very good foresight and on their part to pay attention to that because, as you know, um, the, the hotel industry or tourism is very much global now so it is it, uh, it is affected it affected of course where uh, cruise ships can port and where you know all, all the countries that they can well the next industry frequent. sort of so obviously things kind of kicked off and i think most people by now know that it was about march of 2020 when uh the speed started to gain and and uh national news started to make it but um so december for the hotel industry of right. the prior year 2019 and then it was um i think it was early february or maybe even late January when it was the dental industry started predicting and knowing that this was coming. And it was yeah. funny because a lot of the dentists came back from a big conference and all wanted to value their properties. And the guys that were going to retire in the next one to two years, they all moved them to, <laughs> to the next guy. <laughs> so yeah. the, those dentists, they're some smart nuts. They <laughs> sometimes um, they tend to be. So we, uh, uh, you performed a, a number, I think it was about half a dozen or even a dozen appraisals very quickly yes. uh, for clients that were in a hurry. Yes. A lot of private deals, owner finance deals. Yeah, it was, private it deals. Was, yeah. It was interesting. And we moved a bunch of commercial properties uh, before yeah. March. Yes. <laughs> so, so. so I pay attention. So when these guys say... Um, beware or something's coming or there's a blip or we should start paying attention to this uh you should too because we do and so what are they saying they're saying some things are coming to mature some adjustable arms are going to get readjusted yes. right the interest rates that we've been talking about for a while they are affecting the next um what, what do they call it it's a refi or just a restructure yes restructure the five-year restructure is yeah. getting ready to mature yes and uh it's not looking good Right. Um, hotels, I, I guess, should not surprise us. Um, they're really saying that's kind of the sector that caters to the business clientele. So the mm -hmm. ones that are, you know, have conference rooms and, and kind of cater to these business trips and travel, uh, that's not really happening as it used to. 
as we know, there's a lot of the uh, virtual work force now that yes. uh, is uh, part of that is they don't do these conferences. They don't do the travel. Um, so they're seeing a very large decline in the occupancy of these hotels that cater towards business trips, business travel. Yeah, well, we ourselves have not attended a conference out of out of outside of Alaska in in, in over two years. Yes, it's and been I know fantastic. The Institute's not having. Yeah, and I don't think we should conferences do here, conferences so in yeah. Lower Forty Eight at all ever yeah. again. Um, I'd so. just as soon stay up here, right, um, or attend them virtually. Now that we know we can, why do we all have to travel? Well, and that's I think what's the the effect is is of of that of you know the way that the that the nature of business has changed yeah. has it has a ripple effect it's not just the office sector anymore it's like you know we're pointing out here these hotels conferences and, and uh, or right. uh, conference centers and the hotels right. around them uh tourist attractions so uh just prior to uh, it was early 2020, a bunch of, of new large places had just kind of come online in Memphis and um, uh, um, was it Louisville, Kentucky had a big one. We were planning on going to one there. Um, where else? Um, was it Fa Fairbanks right now is looking at maybe creating some conference center, but hasn't happened yet. So right. um, that whole industry just kind of got put on hold for a while. And uh, you can't do that for very long and not have it not affect the bottom line. Yes. So uh, as what we're saying is, uh, you know, if uh, if you're an investor and um, you know, this is something you should be paying attention to and probably already are um, either you might want to adjust your position based upon what's coming up here in the hotel yes. industry. Uh, I think um, a lot of businesses restructured uh, yeah. during the this this last few years uh, and and really did cut costs and a lot of costs can be associated with travel um, and yeah. you know that all the whole um, networking component of a lot of business right. was really kind of just well stopped at first and then never really kind of came back. Okay, so trouble on the uh, on the outlook for the hotel industry. Yes, and uh, pay attention to that. Uh, with that, uh, Airbnb has also been in some trouble lately. They're doing some restructuring and having some growing scale related pains. Um, the news along uh, from that industry is that a lot of micro investor level is in single Airbnb or these small companies that would gobble up and. Uh, kind of master lease places to yeah. run Airbnb things. Um, uh, regulations have been changing for those, and so that is affecting them. And in addition, a lot of them did it on variable rate mm. mortgages. Yes. And so anybody with a variable rate mortgage is getting nervous these days, as they should be, and uh, looking at restructuring, except rates being what they are today, those thin margin investments are a little more sketchy right now yes because there's not as much room to in that cash flowing budget right to have a higher interest rate so a lot of people are changing their minds and changing what they're going to do and um what that means for the rest of us is that uh, the nature and characteristics of once again housing may be changing uh, yes, I think, you know, Airbnb has done some wreckage in a lot of areas. Um, and I better caveat and say, when we say Airbnb, we should stop. What we need is the short-term rental market. Yes. There are more than one company sure. that does that. Yeah, the short-term market rental uh, STRs, have, it's been the term around for a long time. Uh, the new Only, players, of course, are these. Just because uh, I don't want to get sued by yeah. Airbnb. <laughs> please please don't sue us. I actually have some stock in you, so yeah, yeah, don't sue there's, us. There's yeah. many of them out there uh, that do this, um, and they kind of try to cater to some kind of niche um, idea. Um, you know, having traveling with pets is a big deal. Traveling to a place where you have the whole property for yourself is a big deal. So right. there's there's a lot of uh, change. Kind of change is happening in that area. A lot of frustration from users that is coming to light um, about fees that are mm -hmm. seem to be excessive or 
Um, the Wild West days appear to be yeah. over and some yeah. regulation is coming and uh, some pushback from the sure. consumers. <laughs> so uh, that's national. What else do we have nationally trending um, as far as in the uh, uh, markets that we're keeping track of um, is that kind of it for the national news this week there's a lot going on nationally it's kind of like what what do we want to talk about as right. far as the, what affects commercial real estate and more specifically what's affecting us in alaska um, i mean we did get an approval on the uh, uh the willow project um but uh a conditional approval that really doesn't actually approve it to a scalable level like the the executive branch didn't fully approve the project and so what they did approve isn't necessarily cost effective there's a lot of unknown there right. it's not not necessarily good news for alaska basically right um just some small scale stuff a hill core is expanding a little bit but um yeah other than that i think regional banks are kind of taking a cautionary view right now right so last week we did our special episode we talked about some of the collapsing banks in, in the lesser 49 and uh, we talked about the health of Alaskan banks, and of course, we watched that, but we've been watching really closely the last yes. couple of weeks. So uh, by the time of our recording last week, I think it was Northern Bank was the only one that had actually made a statement um, the next day after our or maybe the day that our video went live. Uh, First National Bank CEO came out and made a yes. public statement uh, that was slightly concerning. They could have worded it better. <laughs> um, I don't think there was actually a problem. They just probably forgot to pass that statement by the PR department first. Sure. Um, <laughs> we all make mistakes. Uh, but with that said, uh, you know, their stocks were kind of plummeting at the time. They haven't fully recovered. First National Bank hit their like 52 week low uh, right about that time yeah. and has not bounced back or recovered yet. But with that said, Northrop Moths also took a dip. So did Denali State. Um, but none of them took dips that are really extreme. So I don't think there's anything there for our viewers to be concerned about right now. I'm not telling you to go, you know, get your money out of one yeah. of these banks. Um, the thought has become there's this thing that's uh, d d rumor uh, advice from national um, investors right now is that you should pull out of small banks and invest in the larger banks, which we know our federal government considers to be too big to fail. Yeah. And as such, uh, their financial advice is just to not have money in smaller banks. I, I don't actually agree with that advice. I don't think it's uh, the best advice. I think the foundation and strength of our communities comes from these small banks. In Alaska, we're talking about uh, McKinley Bank, Mount McKinley Bank, Denali State Bank, Northrum Bank, First National Bank of Alaska. These are the strength of our communities. And they not only employ local Alaskans, they invest heavily in the yes. communities that yes. they're in. And you are at that point doing business with your neighbors. Yes. And uh, they they all try to help with the aid of Small Business Administration, the SBA program, allow, you know, small and middle, medium size businesses, um, you know, grow. And that's it's kind of what they they're goal is is to establish strong business in Alaska yeah. and we certainly need that we certainly need accessible uh, financing tools to allow um, local businesses to be able to you know either continue to grow stay grow, healthy yes, pay their right. people ride through ups and downs exactly yeah um, and so a lot of them participated in the um, the COVID funds that came through the CARES Act. It did. Uh, yeah. And in order to get that into the hands of as many businesses as possible, right. help them weather, you know, the storm of, you know, uh, not having potentially any revenue. Right. The state of Alaska partnered with primarily Credit Union One. And we don't talk about them very much when we talk about Alaskan banks. One, they're not a bank. They're a credit union, so they're not the same. And two, they're just not into commercial markets. Yeah. So they have almost no effect on the commercial markets in, in Alaska. Um, but with that said, we hear a lot of good things about them. Um, I've had nonprofit accounting with them, and, and they did an excellent job of servicing those accounts. Um, but uh, they're they're not in the forefront of of our right um, our thought processes, and we certainly don't see their influence in the commercial markets very much. Yeah. Same as KeyBank. KeyBank practically doesn't exist in Alaska. 
Um, and Wells Fargo is in or out, one foot in, one foot out, can't make up their mind. So I don't know. So with that said, uh, that's kind of what's happening in uh, the the national and some of how it's affecting Alaska. Uh, I know we had some more roof collapses in Anchorage. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, yes. And then um, along the lines of things happening in Anchorage, uh, you have uh, Anchorage has changed their mind on how they're going to regulate parking, right? Talk a little bit about uh, that yes. and what that means for the businesses and people in Anchorage. Well, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended to city council and it was approved and uh, went into effect in January. The amendment to the parking requirements for new development, especially for multifamily and uh, mixed use developments. Mm -hmm. So what they were saying was that uh, surface parking lots have become a large portion of the city's total land area. Uh, and it's kind of gobbling up a lot of the usable space for development. Um, they feel like it's it's a barrier to entry for developers to build because then they have these set requirements uh, for parking that are dictated by zoning um, that are, you know, pretty hard and fast. Mm. Um, and so they're saying based on what they're observing and what they've seen in other cities who've done away with requirements of parking, like specific requirements per uh, we're laughing because i'm pretty sure they quoted like portland or yeah well like, it's you know the concern uh, brilliant I, yeah so areas where they don't have snow right they don't have yeah. snow coverage right. but you know need room for your snow storage um that's what happens when you hire <laughs> i mean listen please hire alaskans to do market research it, these are cities and Sladotna is especially recently guilty of this. They hire a Portland firm to come up here and and analyze decisions and uh, make recommendations in engineering um, and city planning about things like roundabouts and parking yeah. lots, spaces and how many spaces and how big the spaces should be and things like that. And they're hiring people that have never been to Alaska who have never seen snow and right. have no idea what they're doing. Yes. Because they are the lowest bidder. Yes. Well, of course they are. <laughs> right. So, so this new oh ordinance my. Is, is, is interesting. It's, uh, it says eliminates the parking minimum requirements yeah. citywide. I don't know about that. And allows for the developer to basically to determine what kind of parking it, they need for their use. The developer. Yes. And it's uh, designed to increase accessible spaces, mm -hmm. uh, create requirements for bicycle parking, mm -hmm. and establish alternative transportation amenities that developers can choose from for a larger development. Well, listen, I support uh, smaller government stranglehold on businesses. I think that overall, as a general rule, it is better that we free up the markets to make their own determinations. So the, um, the, the local landowners, the consumers, the yes. players, the residents of Alaska and of Anchorage ultimately will decide what happens here. Yes. With that said, responsible coaching and guiding is not necessarily a bad thing either. Well, the concern becomes that Anchorage is not really a pedestrian friendly. No, very much not so. And it's not very, not really designed to, uh, to allow for that. I know they're trying to do that in, in downtown area, but outside of there, if you don't have a vehicle, it's very difficult to get around Anchorage, especially with the bus uh, system has been cut down to... Finan yeah. Yeah. yeah, financial issues, you know, have, have resulted in a lot of cuts to the bus system. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, in theory, it sounds like, uh, you know, it's, yes, let's allow for, you know, developers to decide. The market players yes. to determine their own thing. Yeah, the market players. And, and they can hang themselves, right? They sure. If you develop something, you know, the new Chuck E. Cheese going in has like four parking spots, then they're just not going to get very many patrons. Yes. And that's a self-correcting right. problem. So I think, you know, in the multifamily area, that's it's going to be crucial because, um, as you know, Alaskans typically have larger vehicles right. and multiple vehicles. We're seeing yeah. more of a trend of multiple multiple generations living in a single unit. So, I mean, it's 
you drive down it's any Alaskan be interesting street to see and you usually see three or four cars. The, so is this yeah. for all zoning or just a certain zoning? Um, I, from what I read out of the details, it's really the multifamily zoning and the okay. mixed commercial zoning. So the ones okay. that allow for... The um, ones that... Yeah, but well, you know, I don't know how broad a brush this is. They, I mean, basically, they're trying to simplify the process of development, and they're mm -hmm. trying to encourage redevelopment of vacant, you know. Well, Anchorage is running areas. out of space, and redevelopment is key to keeping the city healthy. Um, yeah. And there are some areas that are are really prime and ready for redevelopment. Yes. Um, the Spinard area is one that uh, over the last couple of years has has definitely been prime for redevelopment. And um, it's good to have, uh, like we say, the local market participants really be involved heavily in the determination of what is best to be definitely. on the properties that they own. So with with that said, um, we'll see how this plays out. Um, it, you know, this doesn't take away the fact that there are still recommended numbers of parking on type of business and type of, of uh, use. Yes. So there's still some industry standards. There are still some real of, rule of thumb and there are still some code yeah. nationally um, that exist. And so yes. this is not eliminating the fact that there is a rule of thumb or recommendation of a certain amount of parking for an industry type as well. So it's just removing the red tape involved with the city itself. Yes. What's what's going to be interesting is further down the road where this comes into play in condemnation. Right. Because uh, when you go against the state, when they take half of your parking and the state says, well, you know, there is no real... That really is the problem. Rec there's yeah. no requirement for you to have all of this parking and we're just going to take half of it and pay you... Nothing because it cents, doesn't affect you know, the property. Yeah, uh, um, that's. But well, we know there's a certain um, interesting argument condemnation <laughs> appraiser who can be paid to say anything in Anchorage. So well, maybe they'll hire him. It's you know the, we we can't foresee all of the implica implications that will happen out of this. Um, but in theory, yes, the less le regulation over you know the the market of development and, mm. and users, um, the better, and. They will bear the cost if if they mess it up. So I mean, it's it will it will play out in market value for sure. Okay. Um, and we we'll, we'll see that you know once we see these developments who fall in this new category here with not having a required parking yeah um definition basically for their use yeah. Okay. We'll see. Well, exactly. We'll see. So any other uh, Alaskan news or uh, things we talked about, uh, the, the roof collapse, the, I think we hinted at the beginning of the show. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Northway Mall yep. and the fact that it is uh, up for sale, kind of being marketed outside of Alaska. Um, uh, the, we were told that they had a roof collapse this last week. Yes, I think unbeknownst to most, but yes, there was uh, a portion, a of, portion of, of the, the, the mall that uh, did collapse. I think it might have affected the gym. It was kind of inklings that it might have affected one of the only tenants there. So, Oh, no. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. again, another kind of step towards maybe the best use of this property is not... <laughs> Yeah. The existing. Highest and best use. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's yeah. another cost to repair. It's another, you know, issue. Yeah. And we and we got a bid request for uh, a, a, a prominent business in North Pole, Alaska, had a roof collapse, and uh, they're having to do some financing. And so we'll, we'll be looking at that next week. But, uh, yeah, more roof collapses in uh, the spring breakup time in Alaska when the snow gets heavy and when we start to see mixtures of rain on top of the snow. Um and uh, some of these aged buildings that have been through a lot of big earthquakes, they're yes. showing their age. And yes. uh, they're not just complaining anymore. They're just giving up. <laughs> so <laughs> let's everybody keep safe. Pay attention to those roofs. Clear the snow. Um, and, uh, you know, if you are a buyer of real estate in Alaska, you need to pay attention to make sure you hire the right professionals. Yes, definitely. So what else? Do we have any other news for Alaska? That's kind of it. Isn't it? It's, I would say it's been a quiet week, but uh, yeah. uh, I think it's just that global and national news have been so prominent that uh, right. the Alaska news is not 
quite as... Uh, yeah, there's a, a large property in Anchorage pending currently. We'll see if that closes, but it's a okay. significant, significant large property. So, uh, All right. Um, we'll see. I mean, that's... Um, you know, we're seeing some movement in the market, which is which is good, but um, we're still watching for those troubled and pre foreclosure properties that we've seen some of already. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So the requests of uh, foreclosure appraisals have been uh, trickling in slowly um, and not picking up the speed that we were worried might pick up. Yes, it's still young. Uh, the markets in Alaska are still waking up. Uh, we are starting to get some of the requests um, for, uh, you know, as proposed projects to the people getting ready to break ground and, and start doing their big projects uh, for the summer. So this is normal and typical that at the end of middle to end of March, we start to get the requests for um you know, uh, proposed projects and, and people start getting their financing together for their big summer projects. And, um, uh, I would say that's along the lines of a, of a normal year actually. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. Less of it is troubled properties and more of it is optimistic. With that said, it's none of the crazy of the last two to three years. It is more in line with the level of requests and and type of requests that we yeah. saw in a normal year five six yeah. years ago. Yes. So I think I uh, may be back to could normal. There. Well, <laughs> indicators of reaching that 2019 level are pretty strong, and that's yeah. that's as we've said is kind of been the benchmark for most things. Well, Alaska was you know struggling at that time. Yeah. And I, the tourism though is kind of one of our key. Right. industries here so it's poised at this point to have a record-breaking year this yeah. this coming season so i think there's a lot of anticipation um that that's going to make a, a profound effect on a lot of things i think there's a lot of new businesses and new mm -hmm. um growth of services that is counting on this year being a very big year okay. in tourism well, and we just saw the uh, we just saw the mental health trust package. Yes. So we've got some insight into some of the mental health trust uh, parcels that may right. be coming up for auction this coming year. Um, we've also seen some of the early packages for Department of Natural Resources. Yes. And so we know about some of the areas that are going to be coming up for that auction yeah. this year, which I think would probably be a violation if we were to say them. But all that to say, uh, from DNR, we will see more of the exact same thing that they always do. And for the Mental Health Trust, it looks like the focus is actually in a new area. So that's, uh, that's good. It's an area that we haven't seen focus on uh, in previous years. So... They've had some sales in that area, so it's there's some, I guess, some interest in what they're putting out. Um, there is. I th so um, as soon as that is uh, able to be public, we will certainly bring that news to here. I think some of our listeners will be interested in knowing. So if you are listening to the show and you would like to own a piece of Alaska, one of the easiest ways to own a piece of Alaska is to get onto the uh, State of Alaska Department of Natural Resources Land Management Office, and they have over-the-counter uh, properties that you can buy for five or six times what they are worth <laughs> uh, right online. Yep. And they'll finance anybody. And yep. I think uh, current interest rates are about 10.5% yeah. or 10-something percent. Um, and so if you have horrible credit, you can finance with the state of Alaska and you will not be in bad company since three quarters of the people who buy land from the state of Alaska default. Usually as soon as they see the land. <laughs> so they finance for a couple of years at some very high interest rates and then they finally travel up here and then they finally figure out how to get out there because there ain't no roads. <laughs> and they discover that they bought a bunch of swamp land that's worthless. Yep. And yeah. then they default. Happens and then it goes lot. up for sale again. Yeah. Usually at like only four times what it's worth now. So. <laughs> the cycle. We do things interestingly in Alaska. Uh, they don't get a lot of Alaskans buying these properties. Interestingly. So we'll see. Will the middle health be any better? I haven't actually looked at the wetlands to see just how bad they are yet. Right. Um, I don't know if we're going to be involved with it or not. Probably not if they watch our show. So. Um, <laughs> 
Let's see. That's uh, so. That's new news, though, around here uh, with uh, you know the exciting news that uh, our governor was pushing for some agricultural lands uh, around the Nanana area, and it was an exciting project. Um, it has a lot of promise. They are not small acreage. There's some even like hundred some acre parcels. It's open for for corporations, for Alaskans, for commercial level agriculture to happen, and yeah. it's very exciting. And the native corporation is putting a stop to all of it. So, uh, will the governor be able to get that done? I don't think he will. Uh, yeah, that's that's another play that probably will happen in court. Yeah. So, um, they'll be tied up yeah. in court for years. Unfortunately. And that's... once again, the residents of Alaska will lose as large corporations make nothing but money right. fighting over swampland. So... Yes, um, it's it's a interesting play on uh, in Alaska on who has regulation, fed federal regulation apply or state regulations apply, and we have some. We have a lot of state lands that the federal feds still hold on to that yes, have never given us. Right. Uh, no, they're they're in our state charter, um, but uh, how do you force the feds to do anything? Right. So it's an ongoing I have my issue. ideas about that, but <laughs> ongoing yeah. issue. And so it's it. it there's many uh, examples of that that played out in court of yeah. this struggle, and they did it on Denali Park. They pushed out the local residents. They pushed out the historical homesteaders and residents. Um, shut them off, orphaned them, and right. pra practically stole their land so they could have a park. Yeah, I mean, um, many examples of you know who is responsible or who is not responsible for, you know, the wetlands or the, you know, right. the, uh, the mining and all those, those things. Um, because in general, most properties in Alaska, you do not have the subsurface rights. Right. It's only, you know, the basically can just move the dirt, can't right. sell it or excavate it or, you know. Um, Although our process is not terrible. If you, as a, um, you know, I don't know how it works for a large corporation, but on the smaller scale, the individual scale, securing rights, water rights or mineral rights, things like that. Um, uh, not, I, I have no idea how it compares to other states as far as whether we're easier or red, but there is a process and, and it does happen. Um, it's, it's when you have to follow that up with the feds that it starts to become a problem here. The state of Alaska for state residents is, is usually somewhat approachable um, on a lot of levels. It's, it's when you have to get the feds involved that it becomes near impossible to happen, depending on who's sitting in the executive branch. Sure. So, and what you're trying to extract. So, um, I think that's pretty much it for the Alaska news. Um, I did not bring the ask an appraiser question. Did you have an appraisal topic that you wanted to talk about this week or do you want well, me to do stump the chump? I'd say a good one would be how does zoning affect, affect value? Property value? I mean, if we, as we see in, in Anchorage, they're kind of loosening requirements, um, which is a very unusual step. Especially for Alaska. Well, Anchorage's uh, commercial Anchorage, markets say. are in pain. Yeah. And um, trying to figure out how to recover from the over regulation that they've had for the last three, four years. Yeah. So. So, again, so um, in examples where there is zoning requirements for parking is, is one example of, the, of a zoning requirement it can be enforced by the city or, you know, the, the borough, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, when you see a property who does not have sufficient parking, um, a lot of times their their lack of uh, sufficient parking is not just in the requirements set by the zoning authority, but also for their own needs. A lot of times their customer needs are not being fulfilled and they really do have a parking problem. And so that translates into an issue um, for one, you know, the city could step in and say, well, you now have to figure out how to provide this parking. And that either means leasing some area or having some way for people to park somewhere or to get to your building. It can cause a lot of problems in a lot of ways that way um, or changing your use or, you know, I mean, I don't know. I guess a pretty extreme measure would have to be, you know, a downsize of the building. I, you know, I it's it could it has happened. It can go, you know, pretty far. You know, if um, of correcting a deficiency. So 
It does so, affect value. It does. Uh, we do have a real world example just a couple of blocks over from our corporate corporate offices in Soldatna. Yes. Uh, there is a, a building that is owned by someone from out of the area who is leased and managed by an Anchorage management company. And yes. they are losing their tenants because they don't meet the don't local have parking, parking yes. ordinance. And it's a well-known problem to the locals that try to utilize the businesses that are there. And the businesses are, in, in one case, actually shut down by the city. Yes. Um, and, and what took place is uh, the local business, and we're trying to word it carefully, of course, but the local business was told, fix the problem or move on. The landlord, the owner of the building, said, I'm not going to fix the problem. And so right. they did let the tenant out of the lease. Right. But the tenant had to move and bear the cost of yes. relocation. And, and in that, that case, that the city same, encumbered the neighboring lot yeah, that was for that's, parking. That same property. But they didn't develop it. Right. So there are, there's, it's encumbered. But they're, they're not actually able to utilize it because it's not cleared, it's not grubbed, it's not paved, it's not graveled, it's not anything right. it's, except encumbered. Exactly. So So that's an, an, an example of um, where the city did step in. Um, and fortunately for that landowner, they did own an adjacent parcel. Right. So in, in a way, it was an easier fix, but like you said, they they didn't even make the steps to to actually be it be used for what what it's needed for. So um, most likely, that property is going to face higher turnover of tenants, as we've seen. As, as we've seen, there are two actively leaving at the moment, and uh, about a third of the building is now vacant and unleasable. Right, and um, that that of course affects market value. Um, yeah. Right, which is so. what we're saying. Uh, so the yeah. the value of that property is significantly less because of a factor of reasons, but primarily around right. the fact that the owner of the building refuses to put the investment in required of the building. So yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, it's uh, one of those two that is an older structure that potentially could be near the end of its useful life. So it's, there's could a lot be. of things that are, are, are negatives in that case. There are. Um, so that affects the property value does. and uh, what else? So um, again, you're looking at uh, how regulation right. affects. So in, in examples, another example would be a, a lot of zoning authorities have different levels of industrial Zoning. Mm -hmm. They'll have a light industrial category and then they'll have a heavy category. Mm -hmm. And it's meant to separate, you know, the um, the real industrial uses and try to move them away from the well, main. I think the attempt is to limit the negative influence of property values of adjacent uses. Right. Yes. So, so it's it's meant to have established you can't areas. put high end value things next to things that don't aren't compatible. Right. Uses. It's meant to have separated areas of use. So like a lot of the cities try to have some kind of planned industrial area yeah. where all those same type of uses can locate um, and have, you know, can be compatible. Um, it, it's doesn't always work out, um, of course. Right. I was just thinking, yeah, City yeah. of Homer is a great example of right. lots of attempts to uh, influence and, and mold and shape and make positive decisions that end up with a hodgepodge of just weird stuff. So uh, in, the, in Homer, you can have a double wide next to a school next to a you know, <laughs> bar right. next to a gun store next to a this next to a that. Like, you know, I don't understand what's happening there. Um, right. And then there's a lot of vacant space due to over influence. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure how well it's working. Right. So with that, when they do this, these kind of tiered zone uh, districts, mm -hmm. it can create issues with for users finding a, a property. Um, and, and having a, a, a building that can be utilized for their use. So, uh, you know, a good example would be maybe you're a quasi heavy industrial and the city says, yeah, well, you're in heavy industrial use. You have to be in this heavy industrial type 
area or location because of zoning. Uh, that can be a really hard thing for a tenant or an owner to try to find a compatible place. Unless you're in Fairbanks. So well. Fairbanks has actually done this, again, whether by accidents or happenstance or whatever, uh, the, the various zones and, and uh, areas of compatible uses, uh, there are some distinct neighborhoods in Fairbanks. Yes. And as you move around that city, the community has done a decent job at putting compatible uses and it flows. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it be shopping centers and commerce, or industrial or even um, military right. there they have and a lot of aviation yes. right so a yeah. lot of similar type uses and they've got recreation and they all kind of uh, actually for an Alaskan city they flow quite well right so so that I mean it's it's something that not all cities you know that that's a problem but mm -hmm. it can be an issue certainly with um, when you're industrial type use manufacturer, uh, storage buildings, that type of nature, at large, you know, space buildings. Industrial right. kind of encompasses a lot, but as far as a category. But or you could do it like Kenai. And so the city of Kenai just owns all the land. Right. And then they can tell you whether you're going <laughs> to do it. Or, Seward does kind of the same thing, right? Seward yes. owns the majority of the land, the city of Seward. And so as a community, they make decisions because they decide whether the use is going to be allowed or right. not because all the buildings are on leased land. So that's another way right. to control that. It and is. again, so then if you don't understand how that works, Lydia, why don't you explain what does the ownership look like in that case? So, I mean, we talked about this just a couple of weeks ago with a very uh, prominent mall. Would did that go pending again, the hotel? Uh, not that I've seen, no. Okay, but we did see that investor move on to a new investment. Yes. So, so that um, it, it did go active again, so it, it okay. is available. All right, yeah. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, I guess you just you know, go back and check out our other episode. We talked about uh, lease land situation. But right. yeah, so what's the ownership look like with that, and how does that affect property values then? Uh, well, it, in general, when it's you don't own the land uh, and you're a tenant or a leasehold position, leasehold um, position. you are essentially you know, have ownership or stake um, interest, I'd say. I mean, we're talking about a bundle of rights have been divided. And so now your your interest is only in the improvements and um, creates a, a more riskier position. It does. Um, which is makes it a, a, a... Like in the case of the city of Kenai, they can change their mind, change exactly. the rules at any time. And, right. and that greatly affects, you know, what you're able to now right. do on your property you kind exactly. of sort of own and they yeah they can set the rules of um you know, what can be built and how it's maintained and we saw that with main street grill yes. and they came in and said you will replace that roof yes um or to just be fair, it needed to be replaced right <laughs> so I, it certainly can affect um you know things like financing for a tenant so. yes and so we see this in airport properties very right. commonly and that um in order to receive certain uh certain grants from the FAA or other government grants when it comes to airports, uh, they have to retain the ownership and they have to heavily regulate the uses. And so we see the value of airport properties very widely based upon an ever changing rule set. Um, and again, city of Homer's another, or city of Soldotna in this case with the Soldotna airport was a good example because we saw a change in ownership take place and a sale and a potential, you know, buyer was trying to buy it and do something that's not an allowed use there. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of questions raised as to, so right. how's that going to go? And is it even a wise idea for a financial institution to finance the, uh, the endeavor? Yeah. Ultimately, uh, if we talk about with small town banks and if you have enough money in a small town bank, you can get them to do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And so even though the new use and is no longer allowed, they're doing it anyway. So good for them, yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Fight the man. What well, you know, one small town at a time, I guess. But I don't <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't go sour for them sure, um, yeah. because uh, the problem there being uh, with federal grants and the FAA is well known for coming down and putting their foot down and stopping funding. So um, I hope he keep his, keeps his use quiet and doesn't let the FAA know. Right. But that's another example of what is a very commonly non-owned 
land and heavily regulated use yes and how that affects the value then yes of the property right and so what we see sometimes uh, same thing airport uses and hangars now uh, more for the the private aircraft hangars the smaller ones what's common in in cities is that they will require uh hangers to be raised and reconstructed because they don't want anything of a certain age lowering so uh, there's a lot of politics that come into play yes and um some of them make sense to somebody somewhere uh it's trying to trace down what what exactly is the overall goal and and everything else and you know what are they trying to accomplish here and then trying to predict that um, but when it comes to valuing these structures that are on these types of land, that starts to get pretty complicated. So obviously the best way to value something like that are some, what, adjacent sales of the same thing along the same row. We've had that happen. Right. Um, most comparable as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately a cost approach is very relevant for. Well, let's just hope that somebody competent <laughs> was hired. Yeah, all right. So we're laughing because it comes out in court that an incompetent, well, a residential appraiser out of Anchorage got hired to go do the Homer one and valued, fee, you know, least fee land at fee simple and like, well, it, got the basics wrong. Yeah. So. Don't hire residential appraisers to appraise commercial properties. That's what it comes down to. Just because they're certified general doesn't really make them a commercial appraiser. Right. If they have the SRA designation, that's residential, not commercial. Don't hire a residential appraiser to do your commercial land. So. Anyway. It's <laughs> anyway, yeah, that affected them in court. The bundle so, of rights is important. Getting it right uh, yeah. is getting, important. Getting it right. Um, getting it right. So it's, again, I mean, zoning is just one example. Um, the CCNRs are another example, although... Of restrictions, of restrictions that affect... Yes, that affect yes. value. Um, I had that come up this week also. So it's, you know, and it, that's something that you should be aware of. I mean, there's um, certainly, I'm sure, places in the country where it's more enforceable. In Alaska, I don't know... The level of enforcement on CCNRs, I don't know, probably varies very widely. I'm sure in Anchorage, it's probably easier to do. Um, probably in the middle of nowhere, Homer, it's maybe not so much. But yeah. um, just because nobody's technically going to enforce them doesn't mean that, you know, that if they're there, that they're, you know, somehow some can come back around. Um, yeah. Something to look out for, for sure. Um, and just be aware of that legally yeah. permissible thing so just because it's not being enforced doesn't mean it's legally permissible Correct. right so um, a lot of a lot of properties in alaska are doing things that are against some rule or another and, and it's not just this happens everywhere right even within the most strict of cities there's still some extent to which uh this happens and so you know what we're looking at in this case is the 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 current use and the intended use both and apparently the previous use so right. in this case three uses yes uh, none of those three uses were legally permissible by the ccnrs right and so which is odd because in this instance the developer is the owner who started the first illegal use exactly <laughs> he's the so one who, so he's the one who set the ccnrs <laughs> before he sold any of the other lots yeah uh, and everybody thought maybe he'd have an exclusion for his own property but he didn't well it, it's it, he just didn't do it, it if it's not record it could be it's not recorded it could be it's not you know uh, uh, it's recorded I mean, <laughs> amendments of any kind, of course, you know, that yeah. happen. Maybe they're not recorded. Maybe if you follow the trail of the, you know, the title company is supposed to do. It's kind of funny because <laughs> in Alaska, you can re you can record about anything. Right. And so he literally could like take a napkin and write on there, mm -hmm. except for me. Yes. And go record it. And it would be. Right. Exactly. And that would only cost 20 bucks. Right. So why didn't no, he I do don't that? Know. I mean, it's it's really kind of an odd thing. <laughs> and now that all the neighbors are involved and you have to get permission from all the right. other adjacent landowners. Yes. So now you can't really pull that off very well because right. the adjacent landowners are very upset with what has been happening, what is happening and what's proposed to happen. Right. And so 
I don't know. Could have a case to 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 fight it then. And so this yeah. being in a current and active job for you uh, with a financial institution that is. Uh, FDIC insured, and uh, we don't know what the underwriting for this individual loan is. I think it's yeah. going to. I think it's going to stay local within the bank. Yes. But with that said, how comfortable are they in a position where, again, the existing and the proposed use, in fact, and and even the hypothetical use is not a permissible use. And so, how's right. that going to affect the value? Um, the risk at at a minimum, the risk is going to affect the cap rate. Uh, definitely. I mean, it, it can play into many le- levels of things. It can certainly affect value based on an income approach. Yeah. Um, for limitations, for, you know, to a property for, for type of use. And um, so how are you going to seek out sales of other properties that are actively going against their permitted use? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know. And intending on breaking the law, right. fighting the man. Um, yeah. Well, actually, those properties are not that hard to find in Alaska. So there will be some other sales. <laughs> Sometimes they advertise. Yeah. yeah. So that's an interesting case study. But, uh, you know, the short version is if you're doing something against your allowed use, um, the level in which it affects the value of the property varies depending on the um, the strength of the legal authority controlling the use. Right. Exactly. And, um, you know, a, a title search should should reveal a lot of these things um, right. that there are. Did you get a title search f- so from? The, I, exp- I exp- actually, this is an interesting <laughs> one because in this case, his client. Get, uh, it, get a title report to your appraiser. Yes. I explained to that um, in a lot of areas in the country, title reports are absolutely required and given yeah. to the appraiser. Should be done. Um, a lot of times, though, because they're. Um, Records, their deeds and recordings are not easily set accessible as it is in Alaska. Yeah. Now that's probably cha- a lot changed in a lot of places, but still, a lot of the the um, policies in place for a lot of uh, financial institutions is a precursor before anything gets started is to have a, a title search done, and um, they don't have the appraiser. It's funny you say this because this. it's it's <laughs> in the engagement letter, and we know that it is actually a part of this bank's process, but. I don't think we've received a title report right. from this bank in, in, in three or four years. So it's um, not common in Alaska for the, it's not. <laughs> for them to be provided to the appraiser now if they're done in the process of closing Unfortunately, the loan, Unfortunately, what, what is common is that we uncover things in a, not a title search, just a basic search. Right. Uh, that sh- would have come up in a title yes, would report. Have yes. And uh, I don't know, maybe we should stop doing that. <laughs> I, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, I I, and this is the reason why people do get the title insurance, unfortunately, because it's you know it's not a fail safe. Um, it's an, you know there are issues that do come up afterwards that are title concerns. Um, I, I've I've talked to quite a few um, title agencies that have you know explained yeah. the process that they have to do to clear up some things, and it it can, can be a, a very arduent process. Well, I I think that brings us to an excellent segue into uh, something I'd like to briefly talk about this week. Um, You and I had a conference call with a, we'll have to word this carefully, but we had a conference call this week with a um, a vendor Mm -hmm. attempting to solicit uh, their services to us, right? And uh, the type of service that they offer is kind of similar to an MLS, but it's not an MLS. No. They're kind of a one-stop shop and they're commonly used. I don't know if this company itself is very common, but this type of a service is kind of a common thing in the lower 48 in disclosure states, right? Yes. Um, and so the idea is that in in one location, you can log in whoever, you know, and they market to what? To, to real estate brokers and to uh, title companies and to assessors. appraisers and did they market assessors wow okay she well, said state appraisers so i'm assuming she meant these i think that's what <laughs> she meant yeah so the real estate professionals right yes. those who are in charge of either valuing or 
doing market research or things like that. So that's who they market to. And the, 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 you know, the concept is, is really good. The concept is this, you know, kind of like a moving map with a powerful search engine and you can, you know, click on a property or look by type and what comes up is a whole lot of results. Right. And so quickly and easily, hopefully you can find out whether a property has sold before or what it, you know, um, what's on it, who owns it, property records, things like that. That's right. the idea. Yes. Um, and we love to give people an opportunity to, uh, you know, innovate and come up with uh, products that make life better and easier. Um, and, but what we ended up with was a frightening series of scenarios where we um, were shown inside and uh, for about an hour, the sales agent, who was a very nice gal, attempted to convince us to use their service. And I don't know about you, but like the first three sales that she showed us, um, none of those were actually sales. Right. So, and it's what I was saying, the title company thing, what's, what's happening. And so what we're bringing this up is a cautionary tale. Please, uh, you know, we could throw a couple of names of these, but I think you've maybe kind of know what we're talking about. If you go to a website and they say that they have, you know, information, what's important is to know where the information comes from and to have the ability to verify the information. And so in every case, what they attempted to show us, we were able to very quickly verify that all their information was incorrect. Yes. And so if you were to utilize a service like that, and, and a lot of times real estate brokers get duped into doing this, unfortunately, um, if you put garbage into your equation, you get garbage out of right. your equation, right? That was a big thing they taught us in the 80s was uh, <laughs> GIGO, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And that was the basics of computing, that if you start with the wrong thing or you put the wrong thing in, you're going to get the wrong thing out. And that is exactly what's happening with this service. And ironically, or ironically or not, but, the, you know, the cost of this service was more than we pay for all of our multiple listing services. <laughs> Yeah. So maybe yeah. that's what you'd be wary of too. If it's yeah. the most expensive, then it's probably the most crap. Well, and honestly, their pricing is it, it's meant to be just below their competitor, and that's it's. Um, well, she did cut the price in half over the phone trying well, to convince us, but yeah, because listen, the benefit to them is the more users they have, right? So that's that's the whole goal. So but. if you're watching us right now, right now there, you know, down here is a rolling scroll of market data, right? Yes. That is more accurate than what <laughs> she had. Right. Um, Actually, yes, it was. <laughs> by, by a lot, because one of the things that's coming along through here um, is number of active listings, number of closed sales in, yes. in the major markets of Alaska. And um, our numbers are correct. And the numbers that she had are not correct. No. What did she say? There was only like 20 active commercial listings in yeah. all of Anchorage. <laughs> like off by a lot. Yes. Um, and the couple of sales that we verify were so we, we sales that we have copies of the purchase agreement. Right. We know the price that is sold for. Yes. And the, and the people involved. And, oh, good point. Yeah. Because the first point, the price uh, in one case was off by $200,000. Oh, uh, 60000 well, you're thinking a different one then. Oh, okay. So <laughs> every one of them was off. Well, yeah, sure. But every one was off. Um, and then it was off even based upon their own algorithm because they were guessing based on title information and standard mortgages. You're right. That is a flawed system. Very flawed. And we pointed that out to her. But you're right. The next thing that they do is they then say who verified the information. Yes. In every single case, the person to verify the information with was not involved with the property whatsoever. Right. Like not the broker, not even the right firm that handled the sales. Right. Not any of the owners or, or, or current owners or past owners. The information was just flat out really, really wrong. Yes. So, uh, so with that yes. said... <laughs> What we say is, um, you know, public service announcement, be careful where you get your data, be careful who right. you trust. 
Um, and if, uh, you know, if you're not using a certified and designated real estate appraiser, properly designated, right? Don't hire an SRA to do a commercial property, hire the appropriate designation to do the appraisal because yes. they have the right data. Right. Don't hire a real estate agent to give you an appraisal. It's a bad idea. They don't know how to do it. They're not trained to do it. They're not supposed to do it. So why would you ask them to do it? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. And they use these services with fundamentally flawed garbage to try to do their best at guessing a value. And it's just a bad idea. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking to these AVM models that we've seen come up in commercial real estate. Um, Pre prevalent in the residential markets for They're years already, now. Yes, yeah, already being used in the residential world. But I, I've seen a lot of financial institutions try to get into a more streamlined valuation approach to commercial property. Yeah, Re Redfin is once again rearing yes. its ugly so face. So I think this crux model. The crux of it is. Is that... Um, uh, they're geared toward that. They're geared toward an, uh, an automated value model system that allows someone to push a button and say and give them a number. I would like to believe that for city planners or market research persons, um, that these would be useful tools for them. But unfortunately, the error margin that we saw, at least in Alaska, and again, as we were happy to illustrate to her, Alaska is a special place and we have a lot of special people here. <laughs> and all of us special people don't like to tell anybody what we paid for our property. Yes. And it's against the law for you to make us. And so right. doing things accurately in Alaska is difficult. It is um, an artistry. It is not guesswork. No. So use the right people with the right. right tools. Don't hire people who don't have the right tools. Even with the best of intentions, they can't help you. And as they say, the A in Zillow stands for accuracy. Boy, I think that's a good one to end on. So this has been another week and another episode of Alaska Commercial Real Estate Today. Uh, again, if you excuse our outfits, this is casual Friday in the studio uh, due to power outages in Alaska. This had to be a special recording and hopefully it doesn't get out too late as it hits. We'll have to now uh, do some editing and to get it out there for you. But we do this weekly. And if you have a question for the show or a comment, um, and if we can make that question or comment entertaining, uh, we'll put it on the show. Yes. If you'd like to do a call in, uh, we are entertaining the idea of having people call into the show. Um, maybe we will. Maybe we won't. We have the uh, ability to do it. But uh, do we have the will? Mm. That is the question. Uh, doesn't hurt to ask. If you'd like to contact the show, uh, you can contact us at uh, show, S-H-O-W, at A-K-C-R-E, today.com, which is our website. If you're finding this on Rumble or YouTube, um, all of these episodes are also on our website, A-K-C-R-E, today.com. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.